This will be our third part in the introduction of the book of Revelation. We entitled this thing, Here We Go. Here we go into the book of Revelation. This first introduction is when God speaks from heaven. When our great God speaks from heaven. Let us pray and ask God's help and direction, and we'll jump in here this morning. Father, we thank you. We give you praise for your help already this morning. Thank you for uh, safety and getting out here to church. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, all the men out there who, who run these vehicles and get these drifts out of the way for us and put the salt down and, and take care of that snow. We're so thankful for that. And we ask you, Lord, to uh, continue to work today uh, that our folks will have safety and travel and things will go well. We look forward to the warming up in this coming week. And we're just so thankful that that's going to happen. And we just thank you that you're going to do that for us and uh, melt this stuff away. We're going to be in good shape. Uh, Father, this morning, as we're, we're looking into this wonderful, wonderful book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, we ask for your help today. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me now for the message. I trust and depend in you to do that, that we would see Jesus. And indeed, he is proclaimed and honored in the book of the revelation. So we're just asking for your help this morning, guidance and direction uh, give us something really neat that we can take along with us today, something that will propel us this week, uh, something that we would be, we're just going to be excited about sharing with somebody uh, that we meet along the way. So we're looking to you for that. Uh, guide us now. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. In our first uh, sermon, we looked at point number one, receive the blessing for the true disciple. And one of the key things about that is that we are to be looking at the blessings that come our way in life in spite of what's happening all around us and in spite of the things that are going to be happening in the end times. And then secondly, uh, we looked at welcome the greeting from the triune God. We saw how our, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are emphasized and Jesus the most in two of those verses. And we took a look at that in verses uh, 4 to 6. And now today, in our third point, we're looking at look for the coming of the triumphant Lord. Look for the coming of the triumphant Lord. We're going to find this in verses 7 and 8. But let us read uh, the whole introduction as we begin this morning. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold. He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. John is concluding his introduction here with a brief word on what the Apostle Paul calls the blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's pulled out of Titus chapter 2 and verse number 13. Having discussed Jesus' work of redemption, he now turns to the attention to his day of consummation when he will return in triumph to bring history to a close. Allusions to the Old Testament flood our souls in these last two verses. So subpoint A this morning from verse number seven, his coming will be seen. His coming will be seen. Verse number seven begins with one word, behold, behold. This is the call to look, the call to pay attention. It appears 25 times in the book of the Revelation. We are called to pay attention because what follows is very, very important. And then we have the phrase in verse number seven, he cometh with clouds. He cometh with clouds. There are several verses that I want to share this morning that go along with he cometh with clouds. Beginning in, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? John chapter 3, verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Daniel 7, 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Matthew 24, 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Jesus is coming with the clouds. He is coming literally. He is coming historically. He is coming visibly in the clouds. And then we have the phrase in verse 7, And every eye shall see him. This time Jesus is not coming incognito. His first time in coming was kind of neat. He came as the babe in the manger in Bethlehem. This time, it is not going to be quietly. It's not going to be like a little sneak attack. It's going to be with power and glory. This time, his authority, his deity, and his sovereignty will be put on full display for all to see. And the whole earth will see this. Let her be this morning. His coming will bring sorrow. His coming will will bring sorrow, also from verse number 7. John now combines two other verses with this verse number 7. Daniel seven thirteen that we just read, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near unto before him. And then Zechariah twelve ten. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. He says that the audience will include those who have pierced him. In that day, Israel will see and understand that they and us, we crucified the Messiah. 
and, all, and it says all the kindreds of the earth, all the families of the earth shall wail because of him or shall wail over him, it says in verse number 7. But by God's grace, some Jews and Gentiles will mourn in repentance and salvation. I want to read another series of verses starting in Revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Zechariah 13, 1. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And Romans 11, 25 and 26. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Others will mourn in remorse as the just and righteous judgment of God is poured out in the great day of wrath. Revelation 6, 16, and 17, and said unto the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And then speaking of the great tribulation in Revelation 7, 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Amazingly, they will seek death and, but instead of deliverance. They want the rocks to fall upon them. Repentance will not be found in their hearts. Revelation 9 21. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So his coming will bring sorrow. Now, just at the little piece of, of the scriptures that we looked at this morning, you can justify and say to yourself, there is no way some man sat down and wrote the word of God. It is just not possible because the strings just go all over the word of God. And there's no way even the smartest genius who has ever lived could ever write such a wonderful and powerful book as the word of God. And that brings us to letter C. His coming will be in strength. His coming will be in strength. Verse number eight. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Three of the titles of our great God appear here in verse number 8. This is one of two times that God speaks directly in Revelation. The other one is in Revelation chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. These titles serve as a revelation of his person and his power. They also serve as a confirmation and a guarantee that these things surely will come to pass. The amen in verse number seven affirmed this. 
this divine confession from Jesus himself settles it. First, we see he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. These are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. If we were speaking in English, we would say everything from A to Z. The phrase is expanded in chapter 22, 13, and applied directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. What is said of God can be said of Jesus, because Jesus is our God. In Revelation 22, 13, it says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The second title we see here is the one, quote, which is and which was and which is to come. The truth is, our God is the eternal and everlasting one, capital O. There never was a time when he was not. And there will never be a time when he is not. God is in control of the world that he has created. He is in control of all human activity within it, and he will be in control of it forever. The third title is, quote, The Almighty. This claim appears ten times in the New Testament, nine of ten in the book of the Revelation. 1 8, 4 8, 11 17, 15 3, 16 7, and 14, 19 verses 6 and 15. 21 verse 22, and the only one that is not in Revelation is 2 Corinthians 6 and verse number 18. This title again emphasizes God's sovereignty and his omnipotence. Our God has absolute authority, control, and power. He is in control of this world and he will be in control of the next. When you think of all the man-made deities that have been created almost since the beginning of man in this world, even if they were real deities, they are not even close to the power of our Savior, Jesus Christ. All of their powers are very finite, and they are limited because they were man-made. Our God has un limited power. In Scripture, our God's authority and power couldn't be made any clearer. There was a colleague visiting a mission field in a totalitarian country, and he asked the question to these folks who were living under persecution. He asked them, what are your favorite books of the Bible? And he was surprised at their answer. They said, Daniel and Revelation. Well, actually, I think as we're studying this, it kind of makes sense. I mean, if you are living under intense persecution, you would gravitate to books like Daniel and the Revelation. So he goes on to ask them, why are they your favorite books? And they said, because they teach us in the end, our God wins. So if you're living under persecution, you're looking to that. We don't really know a whole lot of what that is like in our country yet. We do have fellow Christians and believers who have undergone sorts of persecution in our nation. It's going on right now. And everybody has to fight and scratch for uh, their true rights that they ought to really have. But God wins. And that's exactly right. Revelation teaches us that Jesus is the ruler over all the kings of the earth. And that his glory and his dominion are forever and forever. Jesus is the one who is who was and is coming back. He is the Almighty. This is a God that is victorious. This is a God that you and I can trust. 
This is a God who will do what he promises. He will do it. These are the things that we learn when God speaks from heaven. The ancient Roman historian Suetonius writes of the emperor Domitian. Now we have talked about him. He was the guy who was the Caesar when John wrote the book of the Revelation. I want to share a few things here about this guy. And you're going to say after this, I guess it's not too bad yet in America. All right. Uh, this guy, this, this emperor Domitian, after making free with the wives of many men, he went so far as to marry Domi Domi Domitia Longina, who was the wife of Alias Lamia. Suetonius also relates that when his brother Titus was seized with a dangerous illness, Domitian ordered that he be left for dead before he had actually drawn his last breath. When Cornelia, the chief Vestal Virgin, now let me explain what that is, a Vestal Virgin, there were women in ancient Rome who took vows of chastity and tended the sacred flame in the temple of the goddess Vesta. There would be six of those at a time. Now, so this is talking about the one who was the chief of them. When Cornelia, the chief Vestal Virgin, was found guilty of having a lover, Domitian had her buried alive, and her lovers were beaten to death with rods. Domitian slew Alias Lamia, which we talked about before, it took his wife, uh, slew him for joking remarks which were reflections on him, it is true, but made long before and harmless. He also seduced his niece, who was married, and eventually, because of the cause of her death, he was the cause of her death because he compelled her to have an abortion because she was pregnant with his child. Domitian was a moral catastrophe of a man. And he was also physically unimpressive. There is an account of him vigorously scratching a festered wart on his forehead and drawing blood. He is described as being sensitive about his baldness and as having a protruding belly and spindling legs. Almost sounds like a cartoon character. This, this weak and wicked Caesar insisted on being addressed as Lord and God. And we complain about our government. <laughs> the Roman Caesars were pictures of human depravity. Roman culture lacked the benefit of the restraining influence of Christianity. The nature of Roman virtue and what Roman culture valued presents a stark contrast with Christian values. There was a man named Diog Diognetus. He wrote these paragraphs about what he saw in the Christian community. He says, They love everyone, and by everyone they are persecuted. They are unknown, yet they are condemned. They are put to death, yet they are brought to life. They are poor, yet they make many rich. They are in need of everything, yet they abound in everything. They are dishonored, yet they are glorified in their dishonor. They are slandered, yet they are vindicated. They are cursed, yet they bless. They are insulted, yet they offer respect. When they do good, they are punished as evildoers. When they are punished, they rejoice as though brought to life. And so Christians, when punished daily, increase more and more. And isn't that the truth? I mean, th this guy was there at the beginning of this, but that's the way it has been down through the history of the church. When the church is slammed and persecuted and murdered, they increase more and more. Don't miss what that quotation communicates. These Christians live in a way that says that knowing God is better than freedom from persecution. 
Knowing God is better than avoiding martyrdom by denying him. Knowing God is better than money. Knowing God is better than worldly fame. Knowing God is better than doing evil to avoid persecution from a criminal government. And this causes their numbers to increase. When people show by their lives that knowing God is this good, others will want to know him. That's how this thing works. So be a bold, wonderful, good deed doing Christian out there. It just increases our number. John intends the book of Revelation to produce radical change in our perspective. He intends the persecuted numbers of these lowly and insignificant churches to feel the reality that they are really blessed. Which brings us back to the hymn, Dwelling in Beulah Land. That's what that hymn is, that's what it's all about. To know and feel the reality that we are blessed in spite of that, in spite of the fact that they are at odds with, a, with the reigning culture of the Roman Empire, in spite, of the, in spite of the hostility of the emperor, and more significantly, Satan himself, they are blessed. They are blessed because of what this book of the Revelation reveals. It may not seem that they are blessed by worldly, fleshly standards of reckoning, but this book will make plain that the awful judgment of God is coming against those who have rebelled against God and opposed his people. Meanwhile, God's people will ultimately be delivered and will enjoy the new heavens and the new earth under the benevolent rule of King Jesus. So it may not seem like it to human perceptions, but those who read, those who hear, those who keep the book of the Revelation are a blessed people. The historian Suetonius also tells us that Domitian became an object of terror and hatred to all. But he was overthrown at last by a conspiracy of his friends, including his wife. Domitian tried to take unto himself titles that only belong to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord and God. No matter how successful the enemies of God may seem in the short term, the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ shows how things really are. Domitian, by worldly standards, had everything. And he sought to keep his life and make himself God. But he lost everything betrayed even by his wife and close friends. Jesus, by worldly standards, had nothing and lost everything when he laid down his life for his friends. Paradoxically, he gained everything, vindicated by the Father, who raised him from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, and gave him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. So the revelation of Jesus Christ gives us the real perspective on life, the Christian life. This is the real deal. As Christians here this morning, we must be careful not to accept the perception of the American culture the world's perception and the demissions of this society. If you are going to hear the words, well done, from Jesus Christ, you will have to do what John has told us to do here in the very beginning 
of his book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. What did John say? He said, blessed are those who read this word, those who hear this word, and those who keep or do the things written in the book of the Revelation. So that, my friends at Faith Chapel, that is our start. That is our beginning into the book of the Revelation. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning. What a powerful book we're beginning to look at here at Faith Chapel today. We ask you, Lord, for your help and guidance as we do so. Uh, we ask that as we study this great book that it will indeed be a transforming book for us. May our lives truly change. May they be just jacked up many, many steps. And we ask that you would give us a, a profound love for you and for your word and for one another. And also for all of those souls out there that we know personally that are lost and dying in their sins and on their way to a Christless eternity. Father, work in and through us here at Faith Chapel. Do great and mighty things of these thy people. We ask for your help and your blessing that we will indeed read and hear and do those things which are written in the book of the Revelation. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving. In Jesus' precious name, amen.